Hey everyone, today I'll be giving some educational commentary and information. But before we get into the video, I have a few important things I need to say. From my perspective as both a creator and a viewer, TikTok, YouTube Shorts, and similar platforms with short videos are a double-edged sword. On one hand, they allow us to gather information quickly as viewers, and as creators, they allow us to reach a large audience quickly. But on the other hand, they can easily spread misinformation, especially when what's being shown lacks proper context. In fact, context is often the first casualty of this double-edged sword. Sometimes, only after receiving feedback will a creator realize they've made a mistake. But often with short videos, by then, the damage is done. A viral video may have already been viewed by millions and reshared across multiple platforms. As it spreads, the original sources and context are stripped away, sometimes re-uploaded with a new, baiting narrative by someone seeking attention or engagement. As a result, therefore and generally speaking, the truths behind some videos gets algorithmically buried while outrage goes viral. I also want to take a moment to clarify something. A lot of people use the terms misinformation and disinformation interchangeably, but they're not the same. Misinformation is a mistake. Maybe someone misspoke, was unclear, or unintentionally shared inaccurate information. Disinformation, on the other hand, is deliberate, like purposely leaving out details to push a specific narrative. Both can be harmful, but it's the intent that defines the difference. Short videos on social media are ripe with both misinformation and disinformation. This is why it's so important to stay objective and do your own research, especially in a time when AI, filters, and algorithms make it increasingly hard to distinguish what's real, what's fake, what's fact, what's opinion, and what's just plain false. I'm bringing this up as a warning. I want to show you a video that was shared to me by a friend. Before I do, you should know that I'm not here to attack or criticize the TikTok creator who posted it. In fact, the reason I'm choosing to show this particular video may not be obvious at first, you might not even understand why I'd have any criticism at all. That's exactly why it's a perfect example and of course, it also relates to monkeys. So here it is. In 1966, scientists conducted an experiment where they placed five monkeys in a room. In the room, they set up a ladder with some bananas on top. Whenever one of the monkeys climbed the ladder to get the bananas, the scientists sprayed the rest of the monkeys with cold water. The monkey would come down and the water would stop. When another monkey tried to climb, the cold water would be sprayed again. Eventually, whenever any monkey tried to climb the ladder, the others would beat him up to stop him. Then, the scientists replaced one of the monkeys with a new one. The new monkey, unaware of the cold water, tried to climb the ladder, but was immediately beaten by the other monkeys. He learned that climbing the ladder led to a beating, though he didn't know why. As the experiment continued, the scientists replaced all the original monkeys one by one. Each new monkey was beaten when it tried to climb the ladder, even though none of them had ever Ever experienced the cold water. By the end, all the original monkeys were gone, the cold water had stopped, but none of the remaining monkeys would try to climb the ladder, nor would they let any other monkey do so. This behavior had become a tradition, even though none of them knew why. Now, before I break that down, I want you to take a moment. Think about the video you just saw. Did you realize the information that is missing from this video? Did you wonder who conducted this experiment? Why and where? What about other details such as gender, age, and species? These are all crucial facts missing from this TikTok video. Did the creator have enough time to describe those details? These are some of the things I asked myself. I also want to mention that this TikTok creator isn't alone. Similar stories have been circulating on other platforms from other creators. I want to help stop the spread of this misinformation and so I'm going to debunk this video and others like it for you. However, when I realized there was too many details missing from what should be a scientific study, no cited resources, and no names, I did some digging for the answers to the questions I had. The truth is that this study is not real. It never happened. But similar studies were conducted and they were much more humane than described in the video. Even though it's not intended, some misinformation can be harmful. This can spark emotional reactions, especially from people actively advocating against animal testing, who can then use this study as their argument, which in effect can then weaken or discredit legitimate advocacy work. Even though I couldn't find the original source of this so-called study, there was one person who suggested that an advocacy group arguing for the end of animal testing 
came up with this as disinformation. If so, then they also shouldn't be advocating in this way. It's basically counterproductive and gives lawmakers the reason to ignore them and others. So how do I know this study isn't real? A few reasons and ways, but simply put, I did research. I've read many of various studies and none of them leave out these simple details, such as age, gender, and species. They're extremely thorough with every detail. But also, I own a book of a 35-year study that wasn't truly conducted until the early 1970s, with similar and other findings using Japanese macaques. In my research, I found that there are many versions of this so-called study with just slight various changes. This is what happens when misinformation spreads, the story changes. There's speculation from at least one person who claims the tests are real and were conducted by the infamous Dr. Harry Harlow, a psychologist in Wisconsin who did controversial test studies on rhesus macaques. However, almost everyone who talks about the spraying water with a ladder story claims it was conducted in the 1960s. From what I've read in Harlow's book, he's articulate and highly detailed. Omitting basic information in a study isn't something he would do. In fact, he's so thorough, that's one reason I find his writing hard to read. He was testing for things like maternal deprivation, social isolation, and attachment. I promise, one day I'll do some videos discussing his studies, at some point. I wanted to make sure that if I talked about Harlow's studies, it would be from him directly. Even if he had conducted this study, or a similar study, the results would have reflected something psychological and not this type of social learning. In fact, Dr. Harlow's studies and this 35-year study of Japanese macaques were only inspiration for the real study. Research on non-human primates as a whole began with Darwin in the 1850s, but interest in the behavioral aspects and studies didn't really take off until about 50 years later, around the 1920s. Breakthrough findings on behavior mostly occurred between the 1940s and 1990s. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you might know that I like studying macaque's behavior as a hobby. I'm by no means a professional of any sort, and I don't claim to be. But because I have some idea on behavioral studies, the history, and how detailed researchers are, the first indication that the TikTok video was misinformation was the lack of details. So I suggest everyone to keep this in mind whenever you hear someone speak about a scientific study. The results to a study shouldn't be hard to find and should be documented and backed by sources. Because there are so many details in a study, I am only going to summarize these real tests. I assure you that I'll be giving far more details than earlier with sources. I want you to see that the real studies weren't cruel as they portrayed in this TikTok video. The monkeys weren't sprayed with cold water and they weren't purposely put into a situation that would cause the animals to fight or become stressed. However, before I do, I need to clarify something before I proceed. Some people try to correct me when I refer to snow monkeys as Japanese macaques. Snow monkey is just a nickname for Japanese macaques that live in colder, higher elevations, like those famously around the hot springs. There are also macaques in lower, warmer parts of Japan. People call them snow monkeys to distinguish the difference between the Japanese macaques that acclimated into the colder mountainous areas. But they are, in fact, genetically the same species. Those differences in climate are part of what made them ideal candidates for this 35-year study which started in Japan. I'll start off by summarizing some things from the 35-year study from the book you see here. There was observations that started in Kyoto, Arashima, Japan that lasted for 18 years before the testing had changed locations. This was an effort to learn sociology along with conservation efforts. A specific troop was discovered to have an unusual behavior compared to other troops in the area. They observed that many females were washing their potatoes in water before eating them, which piqued interest in researchers who wanted to discover more about this phenomenon which inspired others to conduct more tests. Surprisingly, in 1964, they also had a female who gave birth at 25 years old, which is unusual with this species. This species stops reproducing around 19. This proves that the average number they provide for reproductive years is just that, an average. Sometimes nature doesn't perform in statistical norms. These conservation efforts in Japan were able to double, almost triple, their population in those first 18 years. Within the 1960s, Japanese primatologists and observers tried to introduce new native foods to these macaques and they failed to eat them or showed very little interest. Some macaques refused this food to the point of starvation. While the troop of macaques to the west of that location were willing to try new foods by sampling all the local flora with no problems. 
This is important information to note as I move along with describing later findings. It will be referenced again. In 1968, efforts went into making a new location for observational studies of these snow monkeys, also known as Japanese macaques. The goal was to find a large enough piece of land with a perimeter of electric fencing so they could free roam in their new habitat and climate. Here is a picture of their new location in Texas. Sorry for the poor quality. It's a picture from the book. This study would determine if macaques can adapt to other landscapes not native to Japan. It wasn't until 1972 the macaques arrived to Texas. These monkeys were only alone in order to further study them for things that also included evolution, population, breeding patterns, and more. They would be relocated back to their home in Japan once the studies were completed. Because this was an observational study, very few tests were conducted on the animals themselves. They did, however, performed blood work to make sure the monkeys were healthy. They chose the brushlands of Texas because it's flatter, hotter, drier, far fewer plants and more predators compared to their home. At home in Japan, they had 192 plant species to eat from and nearly no predators. The researchers divided the monkeys into two troops in separate enclosures. They would be spending 17 years in their new home. They started with 148 members total. Prior to relocating them to Texas, back in Japan, some lab tests showed that these macaques were unable to function well at high temperatures while on lower ground levels. So how will they adjust to their new habitat and climate, along with the unwillingness to try new foods? How will they survive the heat? Well, they observed that these monkeys were adapting to the weather change by sweating. Females were soaking their fur and then would sit in a breezy location. There were no other noted problems related to the heat in their temporary home in Texas. Researchers planned to provide plenty of provisional food as an adjustment period. To their surprise, these monkeys started sampling the local flora in Texas almost at arrival. Later researchers were made to reduce the provisional food and provided only a little bit of provisional food to supplement their diet. Test results during health checks were showing that they were missing key nutrients which is why they couldn't completely take away provisional food but instead only gave them enough to supplement their diet to fix these vitamin deficiencies. This way, they would still have to rely on local plants. But not all went so smoothly. Some predictable and non-predictable difficulties occurred during their time in Texas. Most plants were cactus or thorny plants which they worried would cause ulcers. It did not and most plants didn't cause health problems at all. However, there are only a few poisonous plants not protected by thorns, which can be near fatal depending on the amount ingested. One plant interested the monkeys that contains neurotoxins. This plant is called coyotillo. It grows in Mexico, southwest Texas, and parts of California. After eating the berries from this plant, the monkeys experience difficulties walking, such as walking with a limp or a loss of motor function in other parts of the body, but a few had progressive paralysis that led to congestion and paralysis of the lungs and ultimately led to the death of eight monkeys. The researchers removed the plants in the enclosure, but yet some males kept reaching for the berries outside the electric fencing to eat them. A majority of the monkeys regained usage of their limbs with no further complications. There were a few other incidences or setbacks such as screwworms, bobcats, coyotes, rattlesnakes, and valley fever as well. They found that one troop was better at fending off predators than the other troop. But because Japan has coyotes, they didn't do well fending off bobcats. The researchers tried their best to control the predators in the area. The first few years in Texas, however, their population declined. Eventually mothers taught their infants what they could and couldn't eat. Casualties became less frequent and their population thrived and grew after what researchers describe as a quick adjustment period. But why did males continue to eat the poisonous plants while females didn't? Just like females were observed soaking their fur to cool down in breezy locations more frequently and females would frequently wash their potatoes more than males? To learn this we have to get into a separate study. Again, this researcher took inspiration from both the Japanese macaques in Japan and Dr. Harry Harlow. Gordon Stevenson was set to find cultural behaviors of learning responses. Culture is a constellation of behaviors that is characteristic of a single social group. The behaviors which are transgenerational and socially learned by individuals within the group. One troop may learn how to wash their potatoes while another troop may not, even though they're the same species. However, the term cultural behaviors, in later years, is disputed by primatologists. 
An example Gordon used of suggestive cultural behaviors with a learning response was the shooting of two members of a troop of baboons. It was unlikely that all members of the troop saw the shooting. Astonishingly, eight months later, the troop still couldn't be approached, even though these baboons most likely saw cars almost daily. The experience of just some of the baboons had essentially become the behavior of all members of this baboon troop. Gordon, the researcher, believed this event was suggestive of cultural transmission. Gordon Stevenson says, quote, My particular interest was whether the learned avoidance behavior of a conditioned monkey toward a conditioning object could induce lasting effects on the behavior of a second monkey towards that same object. His tests were conducted in 1966, just like the TikTok indicated as the year it took place. This is the only factual element from that video, by the way. They didn't use food. They used objects such as kitchen utensils. Rather than cruelly spraying the monkeys with water, they used a humane way of testing and instead used blasts of air to warn them off of the object. They also didn't use a group of monkeys. They used single monkeys and pairs. The pairs were of one male and one female. It took three months to complete this study. No monkeys attacked each other and not all monkeys were hit with a blast of air. It usually only took two to three blasts of air to teach the monkey to not reach for the object. Instead of Japanese macaques or any other unspecified monkey, they used rhesus macaques. They are distinguishable by their half-red and half-gray colors on their backs. Similar to the TikTok video, Stevenson used an iron cage with a door and slots. But this cage was raised on one end instead of using a ladder. They installed a hose that lined up to blast air at the cup where the objects would be placed. There were four conditions. One single monkey was air blasted each time they started to manipulate the object to stop or subside their curiosity. That same single monkey was again placed into the cage later on to see if they had learned or remembered not to touch the item. The monkey that was conditioned not to touch the object was placed with another monkey that wasn't. When the unconditioned monkey manipulated the object in front of the conditioned monkey, no air blasts were used. They removed the monkey that was allowed to touch the object without an air blast to see if the conditioned monkey would touch or manipulate the object, and how long it took before they would touch the item or how long they would manipulate the object. The results showed that adolescent males and adult males touched the objects far more frequently than females and juveniles. But why the difference between males and females? It might be the social dynamics such as domination and ranking, and the fact that males travel once they reach sexual maturity with behaviors that were learned from their mother. Mothers teach juveniles all they know. Troops may have collectively learned a behavior, while new male members would condition themselves to engage in the same behaviors as the females or not engage in the same behavior at all. The 35-year study with Japanese macaques is how we know that macaques are the most adaptable species of all non-human primates. It gave similar results. They can live in a wide variety of climates. But if we don't put a stop to inhumane testing, we could lose these primates entirely, where we can't observe them. They could become critically endangered like great apes. Although I couldn't find the original source of the rumored study, it is said that the study was a lie from advocates to push their approach on animal testing. I don't know if this is true. All of my sources will be in my video description. I hope you all found this interesting and that it gives you a good reminder that social media spreads a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Without full context and without cited sources, it can be easy to make people misinformed. Always look for resources and do independent research. Therefore, I will be leaving all my cited resources from this video in my video description for anyone interested in researching on their own. I'll close this by saying this, misinformation or disinformation, and the truth often gets algorithmically buried, while outrage goes viral. A repost or share often replaces research and sometimes critical thinking skills altogether. A lie, if it looks good enough, becomes gospel that is staged along this virtual highway we call the internet. Don't take mine or anyone else's word as facts until you do your own research. Thank you for watching.